we are going to open our Bibles to Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. Today is uh, the wrap-up, actually, of a series that we have been in since all the way back the Sunday after Easter. We have been working our way through the book of Romans, and, and we said it was, it was probably going to take a long time, because not only is the book of Romans uh, a longer book in the New Testament, but it's also deep. And there is so much good truth and so much uh, to learn and, and pull out of uh, this book. And we have done that over the past uh, almost, I would say, five, six months almost. And, and it's been good. It's been really good. And we come now to the end of, of where we are going to go beyond this passage. Uh, Paul has some personal notes for the, the people in Rome and he greets uh, some folks and so on and so forth, and the way he often does at the end of his letters. And, and we're not going to, to preach on that because I'm just not sure what I would do with greet Phoebe, I commend Phoebe, and greet so-and-so, and greet so-and-so. I'm, I'm just not sure what, I would, what we would teach. I'm sure the Spirit has something. Uh, but because it's Advent uh, next week, because uh, Christmas is right around the corner, we're, we're going to wrap up our series here uh, with Romans 15, verses 1 through 13. So, um, of course, there's Bibles underneath the pews if you need to, or the seats if you need to use them, and the words are on the screen, uh, however best you can engage God's Word today. So let's read Romans chapter 15. Uh, listen to the Word of the Lord this morning. We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please our neighbors for their good, to build them up. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and through and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had. So that with one mind and with one, and one voice, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth, so that the promises made to the patriarchs might be confirmed, and moreover, that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles, I will sing the praises of your name. Again, it says, rejoice you Gentiles with his people. And again, praise the Lord all you Gentiles, let all the peoples extol him. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will spring up, one who will arise to rule over the nations. In him, the Gentiles will hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Father, as we open your word this morning, um, as we look to you, Father, you, uh, you find us in the very different spots of our lives, wherever we are on this journey with you, um, Lord, you know it. And so we pray that you would open our hearts in the places that they need to be opened today. That you would convict us maybe where we need to be convicted. That you would build us up where we need to be built up. Lord, that you would, you would edify and strengthen us. And that through your word today, we would feel the transformation of the Spirit once again seeing the molding and the shaping that you are doing in our lives. Lord, we, uh, we pray against any, uh, <laughs> any work of the enemy to distract us, to pull our attention away from you. Father, we send them from this place in Jesus' name, and we pray that you would guard us and protect us in this time, that we may hear clearly what you have for us today. Lord, now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. We pray... In his name, the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. So if you have, uh, if you've been with us, you probably remember some of, the, some of this, but uh, because of, you know, things that, that happen like hunting season and, uh, you know, absences and whatever else, uh, not everybody's been here. So there's a quick refresher of where we've been. 
Uh, because I think this is, this is super important, especially as we come to the end of this series. We spent a long, long, long time going through the, the beginning of the book of Romans, Romans 1 through 11. And, and that, that section of scripture is what we, what we have been calling a series of, of uh, indicatives. These are truths. Over and over and over again, Paul talks about what is true based on God's word. The source of truth for us. That we are sinners. That we are lost, hopelessly, until God comes and intervenes on our behalf in the person of Jesus Christ. And that he comes and he dies for our sins so that we may be reconciled, that we, our, our relationship might be restored with God. Without Jesus, we have nothing. We have no hope. We have no possibility. We can't earn our way back to God. There's nothing we can do to make up for what we've done. The sin in our lives. The rebellion that we have, uh, that we have uh, and, and experience and, and participate in in our lives. But Jesus comes and even though the wages of sin is death, the gift of God through Jesus Christ is eternal life. When we put our faith in him, when we surrender our lives to him. And when we do that, not only do we become right with God, what we call justification, we also begin this process of being molded and shaped into the image of God. We call this sanctification. The reality that, that God doesn't just accept us, but he transforms us. He doesn't leave us in the way that we were, but he transforms us into what he is making us to be, what he created us to be, the, the fullness of who we are called to be in Christ. And this is what Paul is talking about over and over and over and over again in the first 11 chapters. These are the mercies of God. This is what God has done on our behalf. And it's amazing. And so in the beginning of chapter 12, Paul makes a transition. He says, in view of that, all of what we talked about, all of the first 11 chapters, now let's talk about how we should live this out. What should we do in response to this? And he says, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. A living sacrifice is one that is knowingly, willingly surrendering their lives over and over. It's not a one and done sort of thing where we say, yep, I believe in Jesus. It's the end, right? Now I can just do whatever I want and, until, and, until the, the time comes for me. Uh, that's not what Paul is saying. He's saying this is an ongoing process. A living sacrifice over and over. He says, and to do this, you are to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You, you, that the Spirit is working in you. That you are being changed. That, 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 that there's an active process that's going on here. We're not conforming to the pattern of this world anymore. We're not looking like we used to look. Our old self is dead. It's gone. Our allegiance isn't to anything out there. It is to one person and one person only. And that is Jesus Christ. And so we surrender our lives. And when we surrender ourselves, something's going to be different. Things are going to be different. So he goes on and talks about what some of these differences are. That we remember that we are not individuals alone, but that we are part of a body. The body of Christ. The church. Not just this church, although this is a, you know, a representation of the church, the body of Christ here, here in Hopkins. But the church, we belong to the body of Christ throughout the world. And that the way we live needs to be guided by love. Not just any love. Not the love that you see on TV. Not the love that you get in the Hallmark movies that are playing all the time now. And, you know, not, not love that you, you see in soap operas. We're talking about God's love. His self-giving, self-sacrificial, willing to go to the cross to die for your sins love. That love is to be the guide for our lives. It's the paradigm for how we live. And so Paul continues, he talks about submission to governing authorities. He, he, he reminds us once again the continual debt of love that we have to repay as a guide for how we live our lives. And that that truth, that reality of love in our lives governs how we are called to live. We need to wake up to it, that the time is now. We can't put this off until tomorrow. We are called to this transformation, this transformed life today. And finally, in the last, in the last chapter here, we've been talking for the past couple weeks about, 
uh, weak and strong faith and how that is to be lived out and how that too is to be guided by love. That those of us who are strong, those of us who have, who have been going to church all our lives and know all of the things there is to know about the Bible, right? Who knows everything there is to know about the Bible, right? Or those of us, okay, those of us who think we know all there is to know about the Bible, right? And, and, and we don't want to admit it because we want to be humble, but the reality is, is that we, you know, we think we got a pretty good beat on this whole Christianity thing. Those of us who are like that, we need to remember that there are those who are, uh, those who are, weak, quote-unquote, in the faith, those who haven't been in the faith very long, that are, are still learning and, and growing in Christ, that they're on a journey just like we are. And he actually flips the paradigm around a little bit of what it means to be strong in the faith, and that is by accepting others in their weaknesses, rather, and, and loving them in their weaknesses, and even submitting ourselves to them in, in their weaknesses, right? He's using weakness in, in quotation. We do that rather than judge rather than uh, criticize, rather than, you know, do the sort of sideways look that sometimes we do. Because Paul is calling us to keep the main thing the main thing. The key line in this whole uh, chapter 14 is, don't quarrel over disputable matters. He's saying, you keep, keep Jesus at the center. You need to keep the, the things that the Bible is clear on at the center of your faith. And the other stuff, the stuff that we often find ourselves arguing about, you know, we, we, use the, we use the argument of music in church or the way that you dress when you come to church, right? Those things, they're peripheral. They're not salvation issues, right? right? No, one's, no one's not going to get saved today because they have a rip in their jeans or because they have a hat on or because they like rock music over, you know, hymns, right? That's not the point. Paul is saying the reality is we need to keep focused on the main thing because the main thing, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is the one that saves. And so we need to keep our focus there at the center of that target. And so now Paul comes to the conclusion, the conclusion of his thoughts, and he brings it all back around full circle. If you're in school, this is free for you today as a, uh, just a reminder of how to write papers. If you're not in school, this is a reminder of how you were supposed to write papers. Right? At the end of everything, we said at the beginning in, in Romans 1 that, that Paul has a, a thesis. He has a subject that he's going after. He's not ashamed of the gospel. One, Romans 1.16 says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for the salvation of all who believe, first for the Jews and then for the Gentiles. And, and it's that last little part there for the Gentiles that, that Paul has been getting at over and over and over again. That, that Jesus came not just for the Jewish people, not just for the, the Old Testament people of God, but he came to bring redemption to all people. And so that is what Paul is getting at here at the end. That's why we're talking about his final thoughts today. And he begins by talking about, once again, accepting one another. This is just the, the reality that he's been talking about. Sorry. And he brings it full circle in saying, not only are you to accept each other, not only are you looking at strong and weak faith, but actually this acceptance, the way that you treat one another, is modeled by, by Jesus Christ. He says, accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. This is the reality that he's talking about. He's talking, about a, he's talking to a church the church in Rome, who is made up of, of primarily Gentiles at this point because the Jews had been expelled from Rome, but the Jewish people, and, and particularly Jewish Christians, were on their way back in. Now, Jewish people hated the Gentiles. This was, it was part of their kind of law structure and everything. They didn't want to have anything to do because they weren't God's people. And in turn, the Gentiles weren't real fond of the Jews either because, you know, it's, it's really hard to like someone that hates you and, and constantly keeps you at arm's length. It's a hard thing. But what Paul says is he's taking it to the fullest extent of what the Jewish people and the Gentiles would understand is you need to love each other and accept each other no matter what. No matter what. I found this picture and, and, and perhaps maybe one of the biggest struggles and one of the biggest conversations that goes on in, in our country today and particularly in politics is, is the idea of racism. And this is really kind of part of what Paul is getting at. Right? You have Jews and you have everyone else. And the Jews hated everyone else. They, didn't, they, they weren't worthy. 
It, it was essentially kind of racist. Didn't matter though. Didn't matter if they were, were white, black, brown, or, or anything. If you weren't Hebrew and you weren't circumcised, you weren't in. And then we have all these Gentile Christians that start to believe and we have this conversation about how the law works in, in Christian faith and, and Paul says, you know what? All that stuff is peripheral. How you eat food, what food you eat, all these things is peripheral. What is important is that the way you act is one of love towards the other. So if drinking alcohol in front of somebody is going to cause them to stumble, you don't do it. Not because the Bible says there's a law there. You do it because you love them. Right? In, in, in Paul's particular instance, if you eat meat sacrificed to idols, that was part of cultic worship back at that, at that time. And most of the Christians that were, that were coming to faith at that time were coming out of cult worship situations and, and experiences that was the norm for the day. And so they understood the sacrifice of that meat to that idol was part of their worship. And so if you ate that, you were worshiping that God. Now, we understand that there's freedom in Christ and that's not the way that it is. I can eat meat and not worship an idol, but if it caused them to stumble, then you don't do it. But I can, I can save my steak for a different day when I'm at home by myself. That's what Paul is saying. If you're doing something that's going to cause your brother or sister to stumble and you say, I can do it because I'm free in Christ, then what you're doing is making your salvation about you and about what you can do rather than making God's salvation for you about what it actually is, which is a gift to everyone, everyone who believes. And so he says, accept each other as Christ accepts you. You think about the attitude that Jesus Christ takes. Think about, think about that, that image of the Garden of Gethsemane. Right? If Jesus' prayer was, God, I don't want to do this. I'm not going to. Because it's going to hurt and I don't like it. And these people are mean to me and they're going to arrest me and I just, you know what? I don't want to have anything to do with it. He says, no. God, I wanted there to be another way. I want there to be another way, but not my will, but yours be done. Paul's already said, like I said, this is a summary. This is his final thought. So he's, he's, already, he's playing off of what he's already talked about. Romans 5 verse 8 says, God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, while we were still in open rebellion to God, Christ died for us. And that is the sort of love and acceptance that we are called to with each other in particular. And also the kind of love that we are to emulate to the outside world. If we were God, if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more having been reconciled shall we be saved through his life? He's talking about the salvation that God came to save his enemies. He didn't, it, it, we, we get this, you, you watch a movie and you know, you got the good guy and then you got the, the damsel in distress and, and he goes to save her and that makes sense to us because right, he loves her and, and all of the things that go on there and she's good, you know, she's in trouble, not through any fault of her own sometimes. Uh, but the reality is that we get this understanding of the good guy going to save the other good guy or good girl, right? Uh, but what we don't necessarily understand and what you probably don't see in movies very often is this, the good guy going to save the bad guy and doesn't care necessarily whether or not that bad guy is going to turn. He's just going to save him because it's the right thing to do. Now, Jesus obviously cares about your salvation. He wants you to believe in him. But Jesus came to this earth. He died on the cross for your sins for the possibility, just the possibility that you might turn to him, maybe. He wanted to make that possible. Even though we were his enemies. That is the deep, deep love of Jesus. That is the love we are called to emulate. And Paul talks about this even more in the book of Ephesians uh, when he says, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. 
That's how we're called to live together. Because, because there is one body. And there is one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. The reality is, is that we are all gods. We all belong to him. If we have put our faith in him, we are his people. And, we, and the one who judges us, the one who we're responsible to, is him, not each other. Ultimately, we are responsible to God. Now, we're called to hold each other accountable. That's a different topic for a different conversation definitely. But the reality is, is at the end of the day, we are all equal at the foot of the cross. We are sinners saved by grace. And so God can show us grace when we are his enemies. How much more should we be showing grace to each other who are the people of God together? It's a big deal. Paul goes on to talk about the, the bigger reality that's going on here, right? We accept one another as Christ accepts us. And that includes the Gentiles, right? I tell you that Christ has become a servant for the Jews on behalf of God's truth so that the promises made to the patriarchs might be confirmed. And moreover, that the Gentiles, those who were not in, those who God didn't choose way back at the time of Abraham, so that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. Because that has been the story from the beginning. That God was on a mission and chose a family, not just to save the family. He was on a mission to save the world. He was on a mission to save everyone. Right? At the very beginning, you go all the way back to, to the, the time of Abraham, and God calls Abraham, and he says, I'm going to bless those who bless you, and those who curse you I will curse, and all the nations will be blessed through you. Right? I'm going to bless those who bless you. I'm going to, uh, those who curse you, I will curse. And whatever happens to them is whatever happens to them. I don't care because I chose you. That's not what Scripture says. What Scripture says is, I am going to bless the entire world through you. And that gets repeated over and over and over again in Scripture. That our calling, of the, the calling of the people of God, is not one of internal only but that it is always with an external focus. Because God didn't come just to save us here. He came and offered salvation and offers salvation to the whole world. We can go through passage after passage after passage in the Old Testament of how this has played out. From Genesis 12 to Deuteronomy, rejoice you nations with his people. With his people. Rejoice you nations with his people. That's really important. Not apart from his people, not separated from his people. Rejoice, you nations. The, the Hebrew word is goyim. It means the peoples, or the masses, literally. And, and the idea is that all of the peoples are going to praise him. In the book of Isaiah, the very beginning, before even the call of Isaiah, which is, is, is something that maybe, maybe you're familiar with, Isaiah has this vision. He says, in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of mountains and he will be exalted above the hills and all the nations, all the goyim, all the peoples will stream to it. That God, Jesus Christ himself, is established not as just Lord of the Jews, but as Lord of the whole world. He goes on to talk about how the, everyone goes up there. They hear the word of the Lord. And then the, the famous passage, they will uh, beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hook. No longer will they train for war anymore. Right? That when, as God is established as the ruler and Lord of this world, earth, and he's talking about the time when Jesus comes again and he establishes the kingdom forever that all the peoples will stream to him. Think of that passage in, in, Roman, or, I'm sorry, in Revelation, right? I, I looked and I saw from every tribe and tongue and nation and language and people, I saw this great multitude before the throne. He's like, I didn't look and I just saw uh, the church or the Dutch people or the, sorry if you're not Dutch, right? Uh, or the Jews or whatever. He doesn't say any of that. I, have to, I, have to I was just reminded that I, I don't live in Granville or Zealand that those comments, those Dutch comments can be hurtful. Um, <laughs> right? He says, I, I, I saw a great multitude from every corner of the earth. 
And they were all before the throne. And they were all bowing down and they were all worshiping him. There was no separation at that point in time. That God is Lord of all people. And Jesus Christ's salvation, right? The John 3.16 salvation. That those who would believe, not just the Jews who would believe, not just, right, I should make the Dutch comment again, I almost did, uh, that, that all who believe in him would not perish, but have eternal life. The psalmist writes about this in Psalm 18. Uh, Psalm, it writes about this in Psalm 117. Right? Praise the Lord, all you nations, all you goyim, all the peoples. Extol him, all you peoples, for great is his love towards us. And Paul has already answered this question too because it's a conclusion, right? He's already answered this, this question as well. Is God the God of Jews only? Or is he also the God of Gentiles? Yes, the Gentiles too. This has been the point all along. Since the very beginning. Through him, through Jesus, who through his death and resurrection was crowned as the Lord of this world. We receive grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. And you also are among those Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. You know, there's a, a, a time not long ago in the church where uh, we focused a lot on numbers. And not just this church. I mean, in general, the church in North America. It was called the Church Growth Movement. It happened in the 80s and the 90s. Uh, and it, it was all about getting people to come to church. This is where your, your seeker services and seeker churches uh, came up. I, I'm not offering a criticism about this, but the reality was it was about getting people in. And I think a lot of times we still operate in this capacity of getting people into church. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. I think it's great that we gather to worship and I think the church is great and, and the capacity of this community to show love to others is, is always astounding to me. Uh, it's happening again this week. Right? It happened with, with Rick Harmson in the funeral that we, we, uh, that we were able to help and, and host here and everybody that reached out and it's happening again this week with, the, with, with Connie Jordan's funeral. Uh, and, and I'm just always so amazed at this. But what if... What if our paradigm for church and mission wasn't about getting people in, but it was about sending people out? What if we looked at what Scripture is saying here in Romans 15, and we looked at what Scripture says all throughout Scripture, and we judged our missional and, and mission capability not on our gathering capacity? This is fun. I love it, and I hope we keep doing it. But what if we don't judge our, our, our good churchness on our gathering capacity, but we, we judged it on our sending capacity. What if we looked at ministry and said, we are doing well because we are sending people out to preach the gospel to the Gentiles? Right? The Gentiles of our day are the people who don't know Jesus. The people who aren't a part of the church. What if we judged our abilities and our, our successes, right, our vision for the church and the goals that we have, what if we judged those things not on our gathering capacity, but on our sending capacity? I think this is the question that Paul is posing to us. It, not directly, but he's making the point that th the whole purpose of this isn't for us here now. This is good. It's important. We do need to hear from the Lord. We do need to be in Scripture. And, and, and it, this shouldn't be the only time, mind you, that, that we're doing that. It should be an everyday thing. We should be constantly walking in this relationship. But as a community of faith, as we gather here, what if our focus went out instead of stayed in? What if? Finally, Paul closes with these words. And I think they're so, so, so important because it really hits at the heart of what we have as a community of faith. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
we have hope. We have something that no one else in this world has. If you don't believe in Jesus, you do not have this. And it's important to talk about what hope actually means because we use hope, the word hope, a little flippantly in our culture and in our kind of vernacular, right? In Michigan in particular, we say, I hope it's going to be sunny today. Huh? Yeah? Right? And you say that knowing that there is a very distinct possibility that there's not going to be any sun today. Right? That's not what hope is. Hope is not something that we know naturally, and it's not something that we contrive ourselves. It's not wishful thinking. I wish there's going to be sun today. I hope there's going to be sun today. It looks plausible. That's not hope. It's wishful thinking. Hope is not wishful thinking. Hope is happy certainty. It's assurance that can come only from God. It's not something that we made up. It's not something that we can make in ourselves. It's something that is given to us by God. It's expectation that is confident. When I say that Jesus is coming again, I'm not saying, I hope, or I wish that he would come again. I want him to come again. I'm saying, he is coming. Jesus is coming. And that hope, that certainty, that confident expectation is essentially me saying that this event has already happened. That's how certain I am. There is nothing in this world that can give you that kind of hope. Not your job, not your family, not your spouse or your kids, certainly not the government. Uh, nothing, right? No amount of money can give you this certainty. Because everything in this world is fleeting. Everything in this world is temporary. The hope that we have is on something greater than us. Something greater than this. The hope that we have is in the eternal risen Lord, Jesus Christ himself. That's where our hope lies. And so as Paul is closing his thoughts and he has laid out the path to salvation and what God is doing in our lives to bring us to the fullness of who he has called us to be, he ends those words with hope because God is doing it and if God is doing it, it's as good as done. We have hope. And this hope, it's part of our birthright as believers. It's given to us when we acknowledge Jesus as Lord. We aren't a bunch of wishful thinkers here. Sometimes we, we act like that in, in Christianity, um, particularly in the face of, of criticism and pushback. And there's, there's, there's been a lot of that, it feels like, in, in recent days, and recent months, uh, as, as culture has shifted, as things have, are, are turning and taking place, that, that it feels like there's been a lot of pushback. And so we act sort of as if we're a bunch of wishful thinkers. And we believe in Jesus, uh, but we don't want to necessarily... Uh, put that out there because maybe we're wrong or maybe it's not truth for other people. And, and, and I get that. I understand the, the cultural shifts that are going on. However, if we hold this hope in the way that it has been given to us in Scripture as confident expectation, it will happen. Right? The God, who is not just the author of our hope, he is the object of our hope has promised us salvation in Jesus Christ, eternal life with him, in the same way that he promised Abraham all the way back when that his family would end up blessing the whole world and that God was going to do that. When God promises something, it's as good as done. And, incidentally, next week, we begin Advent, which is a season of hopeful expectation. Where we remember once again that Jesus is coming. That he's coming as a baby and that he's coming again. 
as the crowned ruler of this world to put all things right. Paul's been talking about this already. Since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We've gained access to the faith. We boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, we also glory in our sufferings because we know that our sufferings produce perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Peter talks about this too. That we have this hope. And this hope comes in our new life. A living hope of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because he has been raised, we too will experience this resurrection. He says in 1 Peter 3, Always revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared, prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. Friends, we have this hope. We've talked about it for the past six, seven, seven months now. That we who are in Christ know the risen Lord, the King of the universe, the one who will bring all things and all people under his rule and his reign and will reign eternally. So whatever it is that we go through, wherever it is that we see ourselves, find ourselves in life. Paul says this, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. First for the Jew and the Gen- then for the Gentile. The psalmist writes this. This is, this is God's words. I'm always with you. Or, I'm sorry. The psalmist is writing this about himself. Yeah, I am always with you, God. You hold me by your right hand. You guide me with your counsel and afterwards you will take me to glory. This is the hope that we have in Jesus. The hope that comes out of everything that we believe. It is the truth and it is the foundation of our lives in Jesus Christ. And as Paul talks about this, he reminds us Our hope, where does our hope come from? It comes from Christ. How do we learn about this hope? How do we hear about this hope? We hear about it in Scripture. That as we are in the Scriptures, as we engage with the Word, not out of legalism, right? I did my devotions today, so check that off my list. But as we engage and we grapple with the Word of God, that we see this hope, that we experience this hope, that it is built up in us, and that we gain this endurance in our lives. So that we may walk firmly and boldly day after day holding on to Jesus Christ, our Lord and King. It's a life to be lived. It's not a theory to be accepted. It's a life to be lived. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Um, as, we, as we pray uh, today, uh, I just want to remind you of a couple of, of prayer requests that, that are um, in your bulletin. But as we do so, I, I just want to quick remind you, uh, Dorothy Pafhouse, uh, who, who she fell and she broke her hip, uh, she's doing much better now, actually. And she is in the Allegan County Care Facility. She's been transferred there for rehab. So uh, we continue to pray for her healing. Um, we also lift up the, uh, Terry Jordan and his family. Terry is, uh, he's been playing drums uh, lately. His wife passed away uh, very suddenly on Thursday night. And so uh, we, we grapple with that and uh, he, he's grappling with that. And so um, I just implore you to, to lift them up in prayers as well. Let's pray. Father, we, uh, we praise you, we worship you, we glorify you for who you are, for what you've done, for the, the path of salvation that you've laid so clearly before us in your word, for your son Jesus who makes it all possible. Father, we... Uh, we, we stand before you amazed. We, we don't know what to say, but thank you. Lord, you have called us to live out your love in our lives. You have uh, you've made it possible for us to do that too. 
through your Holy Spirit's work in our lives day after day. And so, Father, we, we pray today that, that you would uh, send your Holy Spirit on us anew in greater ways, that you would build us up and transform us, Lord. Amen. That as we think of ourselves not just as your people, but your sent people into this world to bring your love and your gospel Father, that you would give us a boldness and a courage to, to proclaim the name of your Son, Jesus, in every sphere of our lives that you call us to. Father, as we gather here as a body today, uh, we think about those, those of us who are struggling, those of us who are hurting. Lord, we all come with, with stuff, with things in our lives, with wounds and scars. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you would uh, meet each of us uh, where we have need because you know our needs before they ever reach the tip of our tongue. We think specifically today of Dorothy Paphos and we pray for, for healing and recovery for her as she is in rehab now. Lord, at 98, what an amazing thing that you continue to show your faithfulness to her day after day. Father, for, uh, for Terry Jordan and his family, Lord, we, you call us to mourn with those who mourn. And God, we're heartbroken at the loss of his wife, Connie. And we pray, Lord, that, that in your mercy, you would uh, be a comfort and a peace to them. That you would lift them up above their sorrow. That they would see and experience your hope, your peace that passes all understanding. And that as this happens, Lord, as they are lifted up, they would know and claim the hope that they have in you, the hope that Connie knew and they can celebrate that today she is experiencing your presence whole and complete. Father, as we go from this place, as we go to this meal, we pray that you would bless it. We thank you for those who prepared it. We thank you for this community of faith and the fellowship that is here. We lift all of these things to you in Jesus' name. Amen.